The risk factors for aortic stenosis are, first of all, the 2% of the population that has a bicuspid valve. Often, someone in the family will know that somebody's valve was bicuspid instead of tricuspid, in which case, family members should prob probably be screened. And they can be screened at their doctor's office or with an echocardiogram. That should tell them whether their valve is tricuspid or bicuspid. Age um, relates directly to the risk of having aortic stenosis. The older somebody gets, the greater the risk is that they may have aortic stenosis. So that by the time a patient reaches 85, there's a 4% chance that they could have significant aortic stenosis. Um, furthermore, anybody with a murmur probably should be screened for aortic stenosis. And that's important because aortic stenosis, when it becomes severe, is a deadly disease. It's as deadly as a severe form of cancer. The difference is there's a very easy fix for aortic stenosis, and that's valve replacement. Um, lifestyle generally does not affect the incidence of aortic stenosis. Uh, only in a rare case, perhaps, a valve could be infected and, and obstructed by a ball of infection. Otherwise, aortic stenosis uh, seems to affect uh, people regardless of lifestyle. It, uh, the path of aortic stenosis and how it uh, starts and develops seems to parallel the path of atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease, meaning um, valves that are valve leaflets that are uh, soft and pliable um, get uh, platelet and uh, uh, cell deposits on them and uh, result in a cascade of events which culminate in uh, calcification of the valve leaflets almost beyond the point of rec recognition so that normal pliable valve leaflets turn into rock hard uh, plates that don't move and that's the end result of the path of aortic stenosis development. The most common symptoms would be fatigability, shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, or syncope or presyncope, meaning the sensation that you're about to pass out. All of those symptoms can be tied back to what happens when um, the blood flow out of the heart is blocked. And then finally, people may be in such imbalance with the ejection of their heart and blood flow to the body out of the heart that if they do something positionally or are active, there may be such an imbalance at that point where the blood flow to their brain drops out and they may get the sensation like as if they're about to pass out. Perhaps it can be more subtle in someone elderly because elderly people uh, maybe naturally have become less active. And so they don't really necessarily always know that they could have life-threatening aortic stenosis because they don't test their system very much, so to speak, meaning they don't bound up three flights of stairs or sprint to the mailbox. They're just less, less active. Symptomatic um, compared to asymptomatic aortic stenosis is, is a very important uh, fork in the road for decision-making in clinical medicine. There have been many um, documentations and studies done that, that show that once someone with aortic stenosis becomes symptomatic, um, their survival is dramatically reduced. Uh, in fact, as we said before, the survival curve looks as if they have a very severe form uh, of a bad cancer. It's almost a straight line down. So the distinction between symptomatic and asymptomatic aortic stenosis means everything because it's that point where practitioners should start thinking seriously about replacing that aortic valve. It's important to point out that someone can have symptomatic aortic stenosis, but even af after a, a visit to a doctor's office, both the patient and the doctor may be unaware that the patient has symptomatic aortic stenosis. Um, as an example, uh, I ran into uh, an old mentor of mine, um, on a ranch in Montana who taught me everything that one could learn about horsemanship and fly fishing. And I hadn't seen him for years, but very clearly something was wrong. He used to be able to work mm, at a high pace from early in the morning to late at night, uh, in the process moving 10 or 15 miles in a day, and now he could barely walk across the lawn. And I put a stethoscope on his chest and heard the typical murmur of aortic stenosis, uh, which any physician can hear. It's quite noticeable. Um, and I sent him to a doctor who was a very good doctor. And he came home saying that maybe someday I'll need surgery. Um, and then both of us, both physicians, went backtracked and started questioning him more firmly about what exactly was going on in his life and 
what exactly his uh, exercise capacity was and had he ever passed out. And then all the symptoms of aortic stenosis uh, came out. It was clear he had severe aortic stenosis, and he was sent for a successful aortic valve replacement. And that story illustrates how it can go with aortic stenosis, even, even in the setting where two physicians are aware of the fact that a person, a patient, may in fact have symptomatic aortic stenosis. It comes down to whether the patient is in denial. It comes down to whether um, the physician asks the key questions that elicit the symptoms that the patient may have. And it comes down to whether the patient has just, without even being aware of it, limited their activity to such a point that in what they do, which may not be much of anything, they don't really have symptoms. Nonetheless, if put to the test, and the ultimate test is taking the patient and giving them some stress, um, and taking a picture of their heart while we do stress, it may be that aorostenosis is diagnosed. 